So in this lesson, we're going to look at the actual terms of the Treaty of Versailles and consider how much each of the big three got what they wanted out of the treaty. The first thing you should do is copy this very useful mnemonic down into your exercise books, T-R-A-W-L. This will really help you to remember the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. So T stands for territory, that's the, the land that Germany lost in the Treaty of Versailles. R stands for reparations, that is the money that Germany had to pay, both in terms of money and raw materials such as coal, etc. A stands for arms, not the things with your hands on the end of them, but the restrictions on the army and military equipment that Germany was allowed in the treaty. W stands for war guilt. Germany was blamed for World War I. And L stands for League of Nations. So first things first, L, League of Nations. This was the first thing set up by the treaty makers at the Versailles Conference. In January of 1919, the Covenant, which was the rule book of the League of Nations, was set up. So the League of Nations effectively came into being in the Treaty of Versailles. That was the brainchild of this man, President Woodrow Wilson of the United States. Now, here you will need to make some notes in your exercise books because this is the territorial aspects of the Treaty of Versailles. And as you can see, there are quite a few. So first things first, Germany did lose all of her colonies, but Britain and France didn't get them just added to their empires. They became, they became something known as mandates. These were, in theory, temporarily run by Britain and France until they were ready for independence, though in reality, effectively, Britain and France did get these as colonies. North Schleswig, this area here you can see, was given to Denmark after a plebiscite. Most people there voted to join Denmark. Let's move over to the east of Germany now. Danzig, that's this shaded area here, that became a free city run by the League of Nations. Poland, which was reconstituted, which was reborn in the Treaty of Versailles, hadn't existed for a while, but there were Polish people, so they were given their own country, Poland, self-determination. It was given a corridor of land to the Baltic Sea. So if you look at this yellow area here, this is the so-called Polish Corridor. Now, the idea here is that Poland should have access to the Baltic Sea. So that's why they've given Poland this Polish Corridor, so it can reach, it has access to the sea. A consequence of that is Germany loses West Prussia and Posen, which contains some rich farmland. And something else is that Germany is effectively split in two. You can see East Prussia over here is cut off from the, from the rest of Germany by this yellow land taken from Germany and given to Poland, the Polish Corridor. The next thing is that Germany, if you look to the south of Germany here, Germany was forbidden to unite with Austria. Austria was a new country created by the Treaty of Versailles and it was ethnically German, it was German speaking and the treaty makers were worried that if Germany united with Austria, the German term for this was Anschluss or union with Germany, then it would create a, a, a German state that was effectively just too powerful. Next, if you see this area, let's move over to the west of Germany now. This little sort of shaded in area here inside the purple circle. These are the Saar coal fields. This is actually a little bit wrong. The Saar coal fields were actually to be looked after by the League of Nations for 15 years until there'd be something called a plebiscite. And in that time, in 15 years, in 1935, they'd vote either to remain independent, to join Germany, or to join France. The products of the Saar coal field were given to France for 15 years, but it wasn't, the territory wasn't, it was run by the League of Nations. So this little area here was run by the League of Nations. Next. Yeah, this area here, you see the orange area here along the west of Germany, and this borders Belgium and France. This was to become a demilitarized zone. That means that Germany was not allowed to station armed forces in this area. The Rhineland was a demilitarized zone. 
It was still part of Germany, but was, she was forbidden to put troops there. And the part of France which had been lost in 1871, Alsace and Lorraine, France regained this in the Treaty of Versailles. So a few um, terms there regarding the territory. She doesn't lose a huge amount of territory in Germany, but it is resented in Germany, this loss of territory, as you'll see. Now, this is something that the Germans really do resent. This is Clause 231, and in Clause 231, you can see down here, Germany is to take full responsibility for the war. I'll just read this bit out, actually. This is the actual treaty itself. The Allied and Associated Governments confirm, and Germany accepts the responsibility of Germany and her allies for causing all the loss and damage to which the Allied and Associated Governments and their nationals have been subjected as a consequence of the war imposed upon them by the aggression of Germany and her allies. So Germany is fully blamed for the war, has to take full responsibility. What are the limitations placed on German arms? Germany is to be allowed no tanks or armoured vehicles of any kind. She is forbidden to have, she cannot have any military aircraft whatsoever. Memories of World War I and the German U-boats. She was to be allowed no U-boats, no submarines at all. Germany, the army was to be restricted to 100,000 men. This was quite a small army, especially compared to the armies of millions that were fielded during the First World War. And Germany was to be restricted, the navy was to be restricted to just six battleships. In terms of reparations, the three didn't agree. You could, if, if you look at this, you can see why. The USA, these are, by the way, these are not the actual words of Woodrow Wilson, I'm just sort of paraphrased. The USA hadn't been damaged, it hadn't been invaded at all. It had spent some money on the war and, and some Americans had died. However, Wilson re believed that reparations should be quite low. He had lent a lot of money to Britain and France, but he was worried that very high reparations would lead to Germany seeking revenge in future. Clemenceau, very different from Wilson. He had the position, his country, France, was the only one of the big three that was actually invaded by Germany, causing a huge amount of destruction. Clemenceau thought Germany would, should pay. He did point out Germany had invaded France. France hadn't invaded Germany. An extra motivation for that was that high reparations would cripple Germany so she wouldn't be able to attack Germany in future. Lloyd George on the issue of reparations was somewhere in the middle. He did believe that she should pay reparations. The British people expected it. Remember there'd been that speech in the House of Parliaments where someone had said Germany should be squeezed like a lemon until the pips squeak. But G R Lloyd George, he didn't want them to be too high. He wanted the economy and industry of Germany to survive a future trade. And also he was worried too about Germany seeking revenge in future if the reparations were too punishing. So how much did they get what they wanted out of the treaty? Now we've looked at the terms and we know what they wanted. Well, Wilson did achieve some of his ideals, self-determination in Europe. Poland regained its independence, as did Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia. New countries uh, out of the ruins of the Austro-Hungarian Empire received a degree of self-determination. Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia, for example. In terms of the colonies, not really a victory for Wilson. He would have liked for them to have more of an immediate chance of independence. They were given as mandates to Britain and France. The idea was they'd be looked after until Britain and France judged they were ready for independence, but effectively they became colonies of these two powers. Wilson was worried that the treaty was too harsh. However, he wasn't too worried because Wilson believed that the League of Nations, this new international peacekeeping body, it would be able to sort out any leftover problems from the Treaty of Versailles. What about Lloyd George? Well, quite pleased to get the mandates. This increased effectively the size of the British Empire. He was pleased that Wilson's Freedom of the Seas Clause didn't make it into the treaty. That would have limited the power of the Royal Navy looking after the British Empire. He was pleased that the colonies didn't really effectively get independence. What was 
Clemenceau pleased about? He was pleased that this new state, this strong state Poland had been created. He felt that would be a balance against the power of Germany. He was very pleased to regain Alsace and Lorraine. And he was also pleased about the mandates. He was reasonably pleased that the German army and its military strength had been significantly reduced, although he would have liked to have seen even more reductions. He was not pleased about the Saarland. He would have liked to have gained that area for France. France was going to receive the coal from the Saarland for 15 years, but it wasn't given to France. It was, as we say, made a mandate. I'm sorry, it was going to be run by the League of Nations. Oh, sorry, I don't know why that turned one better. Let's go forward. Oh, also, he... Let's go back. Oh, goodness me. Let's zip through these again. And also, he didn't get the Rhineland. He wanted, actually, the Rhineland to be separate from Germany. What did happen, if you remember, was that the Rhineland, Germany was not allowed to station troops there. It was still part of Germany, but it was a demilitarised zone. Germany couldn't station troops there. They couldn't agree, actually, in the Versailles Peace Conference. So a reparations committee was set up, and a year after the conference finished, the final amount of reparations was set at 32 billion dollars. That was the amount of rep that was much less than uh, what Clemenceau wanted, more than what Wilson wanted. In fact, Germany didn't finish paying that off until 2010. Okay, I hope you've got some idea there and you've made some notes about the actual terms of the Treaty of Versailles and what the big three got in terms of what they wanted.